Hi everybody, um, my name is Sarah Geerty. I'm the Cartographic and Managing Editor with the Irish Historic Towns Atlas, or the IHTA, which is one of the research projects here in the Academy. And I'd just like to welcome you all here today. It's great to see so many people in and out of the Academy. And it's an exciting day for us, I think, here, here as well, uh, to see each other's work and talk to you about it. We had Culture Night uh, a couple of weeks ago, and that was another opportunity. It's great to see things opening up again and generally be able to talk about the work. Um, and thanks, Jane, for coordinating this day uh, very much, Jane Conroy. Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you about maps, uh, a bit about my own background, uh, a bit about the Irish Historic Towns Atlas, and also particularly on our cities and how they have been both a challenge and offer us also lots of possibilities uh, from the map maker's perspective, that is. So as I said, I'm Sarah Geerty. I am part of a wider team and network involved in carrying out and supporting the work of the IHTA. And my colleagues, Jennifer Moore and Frank Cullen are here today as well, and they'll be presenting later. So make sure to catch them either in this room or in the demo room. Our editorial board are listed here in the slide. And they and our authors are all from various disciplines, history, geography, and archeology span mainly. And they carry out their work for the project in a voluntary capacity. Also invaluable are our institutional partners, Ordnance Survey Ireland and local authorities, and in particular at the moment, Dublin City Council and Cork City Council. Now, like all historical atlases, the IHTA offers a way of presenting and understanding the past, and it is the urban landscape that is our consideration. The map on the right shows the 28 Irish towns and cities that have been covered to date. And if you don't see your place there, rest assured that there are another 15 towns and cities on our current agenda. The Irish Atlas is part of a wider European scheme. We produce a whole range of ancillary publications and run various events, lectures and exhibitions, all related to the work we do in the main Atlas series. Itself, that the Atlas series is a platform for further research across a range of disciplines and a range of users. Fine, you can check our website and as I said, we'll be out at the table in the, in the council room and happy to tell you more about all of that. Now my role in the Atlas is as cartographic a managing editor and it is the cartographic bit that we will be dwelling on today. I became interested in maps when studying archaeology and geography in UCD, having come from Granard, County Longford, a small but monumental place whose moat had, as the poet Noel Monaghan said, wrapped its earthly chill of history around us. Seeing the moat of Granard expressed on the first edition six inch Ordnance Survey town plan of 1837, um, there on the left, um, which Barbara introduced us to, had a captivating effect. A sense of place through maps, particularly historic maps, which offer so many avenues to wonder and investigate what remains, what was once there, what is no longer there, and of, what, of course, what may have been there, but leaves no trace in reality or on the map. Now, as Barbara mentioned, the Ordnance Survey of Ireland was set up in 1824 to carry out a townland survey for valuation and townland purposes. The result was much more far-reaching, and the first edition six-inch maps, later editions and associated records, have become an integral and sometimes contested part of our cultural history and identity. For the researcher, it is universal in its representation. Everywhere on the island was surveyed systematically, without exception. Physical features such as roads, buildings and rivers measured and plotted. With less tangible topographical elements such as place names, boundaries and antiquity also recorded. Decided upon and added to the map as per the accompanying character sheet or key, which is there on the slide as well. The considerable OS archive that Barbara has introduced us to, the memoirs, letters, extracts, sketches, tell us more about the process that led to what is ultimately presented on the page or the map. 
and our constant reminder of the incredible depth of this as a mapping enterprise. One of the great wonders of these maps is the scale itself. And as a cartographer, I'm obviously obsessed with scale. And the scale of these is six inches to the mile, which is approximately one to 10,000. And how it manages to relate town and country. Allowing an overview of the rural landscape with its network of townlands, while on the other hand, retaining the detail of our cityscape with its dense network of streets, lanes, buildings and blocks. And you see, well, Dawson Street is somewhere in there on the bottom, uh, bottom right. My interest in historic maps began in the archaeological landscape of County Longford, but brought me to the heart of the urban realm and to Dawson Street in the late 1990s, where another considerable mapping project was underway in the form of the Irish Historic Towns Atlas, where I became a mapmaker myself, hooked on that slightly angst-ridden experience of symbolising and generalising aspects of reality, and worse, imposing a bias consciously or unconsciously that cartographers are sometimes accused of. And so to the IHTA. By definition, an atlas is not all about maps, but is in fact a fine balance and interaction of maps and texts, governed by a consistency of style, scale and language. In using the IHTA, there is a presumption, an expectation, that a map contained within will not be used in isolation, but as part of a wider picture or story, to be studied in conjunction with other maps of the same place or another place, or with a piece of accompanying text. Similarly, in the research phase of compiling the IHTA, the process is one of combining cartographic and documentary sources to be deconstructed and reconstructed and reborn in new forms of maps and texts in print and online. And as I said, we've lots of stuff to show you out there. So if you want to see more of, of, of that, do come and, and talk to us or come to our demos. There are various types of maps in each IHTA, from reproduction of historical maps or historic maps or facsimiles to thematic distribution or growth maps. Today, we will look briefly at some examples, each quite specific in how they relate the historic townscape or cityscape and the potential they hold for further research. So the first are our historical compilation maps. I, I'm not sure you can see the detail there, but that's okay. These essentially depict several centuries on a modern base map. These were an innovation mainly for our city atlases as a way of distilling and displaying some of the multitude of historic layers across the larger urban areas. We produce these maps at the end of the research phase when we have the fullest possible list of urban sites at our disposal in the form of a draft topographical information. And I don't know, Jennifer is going to introduce us to that later. I won't focus on this now, but it's a big list of sites. And from there, working with the author, we select a list of what is usually about 200 known sites. These are symbolized and indexed thematically. Here in the slide, we are in Galway. On the left, our author, in this case, Paul Walsh, his draft, and on the right, the final version. It is the Wood Key Francis Street area, now very much part of the city, but called in the past the northern suburbs. The red green symbols are religious, the medieval Franciscan friary, alongside a later convent and friary. The orange are administrative, so town hall, courthouses, schools. The purple are manufacturing sites, distilleries and mills. While the black peeping in represents the line of the medieval town walls. Many of these sites are long gone, may not have been contemporary with one another, and we don't necessarily know their full extent or plan. But the symbols allow for certain patterns to emerge and hopefully inspire. One of the most dramatic and affecting parts of creating these maps is plotting the conjectural line of early shorelines and revealing past waterways overlaid on the Martin Ordnance Survey town plan. They're just some examples as well of the other ones we've done, we can show you later. The second type of map that we're going to look at closely is what we commonly know as map two. 
Uh, map 2 is really the principal map of the IHTA and one of the four core maps that are common to all our atlases and that they allow comparison. Contrary to the historical compilation maps that we've just discussed, what we are looking at now is the town or city in plan at a particular time, the mid 19th century, and at a particular scale, 1 to 1,500. Map two is basically a redrawing of the Ordnance Survey town plans that were produced alongside the six inch survey that we spoke about and Barbara introduced us to earlier. So the town plans, restyled and rescaled to allow the eye to take in the town on one page. At 1 to 2,500, a small Irish town such as Kells County Meath on the right, fits neatly onto a standard IHTA page, which is approximately A3. The bigger the urban extent or built up area in the mid 19th century, the bigger the page required. A double page for Sligo, so Sligo was approximately A2, and double again for Kilkenny, which was approximately A1. And just one indication that cities have demanded much more cartographically from a series that was devised in its early stages as a town atlas. Much editorial effort has gone into retaining a consistency of content throughout the IHTA, and MAP2 is a case in point. It looks the same now as it always did, and offers the researcher the opportunity to analyse the morphology of the town, the pattern of plots, houses in pink and gardens in green, the interaction with public buildings, which are depicted in red, water in blue, and the relationship of features to their containing street pattern, and names, the high streets and market streets of Kilkenny, Sligo and Kells, illustrate common threads in what is ultimately a more complex comparative story. Despite the consistent look behind Map 2, production methods have changed considerably. When I first started with the IHTA, I drew the draft for that map we saw of Kilkenny on permatrace at a drawing table, overlaying extracts from the contemporary valuation town plans to supplement the Ordnance Survey. These days, my colleague Frank Cullen does the digitising in ArcGIS, and you see here our current work on Cork, struggling to contain itself on one sheet of 1,500, and Cork will be displayed on a page six times uh, the standard size. The Ordnance Survey Town Plan for Cork, which we are digitising from, dates to 1842 and required 33 individual sheets. The Ordnance Survey chose the scale of five foot to the mile, which is approximately one to a thousand, mostly for mapping towns. And in a way, in seeking consistency in the IHTA, we are retracing their footsteps and efforts to standardise, represent and bring two-dimensional order to these tremendously dense urban areas. Though the original Ordnance Survey town plans, which survive, by the way, in manuscript in the National uh, Archives of Ireland, uh, OS 140, they do follow a general template. There are variations. And these Cork plans are, in fact, amongst the most detailed. For example, the house numbers included in this extract from the heart of what was the medieval walled city are not usual for other places. And the Gothic script you see, I hope, ish, uh, like the site of King's and Queen's Castle in the Gothic script, is the or Ordnance Service's own attempt at representing the past on what was, in 1842, a very modern town plan. Uh, Frank is going to can tell you more about the process involved in creating this map at his demonstration later. To zoom out for a minute and just to point out that Map 2 is in fact the main connect connecting link to the wider European Historic Towns Atlas. So to be part of the scheme, you are expected, or countries are expected to produce a map at 1,500 for the pre-industrial 19th century, 19th century city our towns, so giving a strong basis for comparative study across the continent. And there's more details there in that link, or we can talk to you more about that aspect. Uh, there's just, so you can see the common kind of style, that's Dortmund in the German series. 
The mapping of cities has provided the IHTA with plenty of challenges and possibilities because of their size, their historical complexity. They have required particular treatment. In the creation of the IHDA, cartographic char characteristics evident in historic maps from the past become familiar in new historical maps about the past. In the IHDA, we have dealt with Dublin City so far in three parts, divided chronologically by cartographic milestones, John Speed's map or view or perspective or bird's eye of the city in 1610, John Roke's map of 1756, and the Ordnance Survey first published city plan of 1847. The extent of the city was an issue by the time we got to Dublin part three, and a new map reduced in scale to one to 5,000 was necessary to pick the full city, the full area, which was simply put, the city between the canals. But the city, of course, is even bigger than that, and the suburbs have an important story of their own to tell. In the IHTA, we have dealt with this by giving the Dublin suburbs a sub-series or a whole series of their own. Places such as Clontarf, today a fully urban district, began as rural villages and have a spatial character very different to that of the urban core, presenting their own particular range of decisions in terms of scale and extent for the atlas maker. When we look to the source material, we see the suburbs dealt with in various ways in the past too. John Roke included the word suburb in the title of his hugely ambitious exact survey of the city. But his elaborate cartouche scales and titles take up much of what could be considered the suburban space on the map. Thankfully, Roke's four sheet map of the environs covers more ground and his actual survey of the county of Dublin more still, accommodated by reduced scales. Roke's cartographic influence is vast, and we see the contribution of his maps in archaeological reports, history books, and even the walls of local cafes. In the IHTA, in the spirit of remapping the mapped, Roke has offered us an insight into the cultural landscape of the second half of the 18th century as well as a stepping stone for working out how things were before and how they were after. Here in Rathmines, when mapping the villas and terraces of the mid 19th century, it was Roke we turned to to indicate where the former path or Rathmines path lay adjacent to the current line of Rathmines Road today. I'm not sure you can see that, but you can come and look at it in the atlas later. When mapping Cork, Roke did so in less detail than Dublin City, but still managed to name the dozen laneways of the old city, in addition to the names of the marshes, which are so crucial to our work in reconstructing the early city. And that is perhaps an appropriate place uh, to end for today. Cork is the first place we will have covered in the IHTA that has already had a dedicated historical atlas, and that's the Cork University Press's Atlas of Cork City from 2005. So again, we're remapping more, and in which we have, we've benefited from that hugely. Here on the left is work in progress by myself and author Howard Clark on what, is the, what will be the thematic map for medieval Cork in circa 1300. And we look forward to publishing Cork as number 31 in the IHDA series in association with Cork City Council in next year, 2023. Thank you very much. <laughs>